Moving on from areas, now we're going to learn how to do volumes using integration. How to calculate the volume of a three-dimensional object. We'll start with the volume of general looking things, but it turns out for most general objects the geometry is complicated enough that the integral we're going to show here doesn't help us too much. So they kind of have to be relatively simple geometric structures. For more complicated ones you can wait till Calc 3 and you'll do something similar, although you'll have a few more tools at your disposal there. But the same ideas will apply. So I've drawn sort of a generic looking figure here that we're going to use to talk about this concept of calculating the volume using an integral. So the general formula, in general, if we can calculate the area in general of this function, the cross-sectional area, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a second, the volume will equal the integral of that area function. So that's our general principle. Again, for most things, the hard part would be finding that area function. So we'll do one or two simple examples where the area function isn't hard to find, and then we'll transition to a certain kind of geometric object where the area function is relatively straightforward. And that'll make more sense when we get to it at that point. So on this picture here, if you notice, we can kind of slice this and it might be helpful to think about like a loaf of bread and how you can slice that into thin sections like this. That's what we mean when we talk about this cross-sectional area. We mean if we slice it across like this, we can talk about the area that's enclosed there. If you looked at that sort of head on. As we do this, we're cutting across the x-axis so that this thickness is a little delta x. Now, you might be thinking already about how we could do this vertically. We could have an object that we could slice this way and have the area depending on y. So the way we've drawn this right now, we're assuming that our x-axis travels in this direction. And so when we write something like the area as a function of x, what we mean is if we're to cut a different slice at a different location, at a different x value in other words, the area would be different. So the area changes as you travel along the x-axis. But you could think about slicing it vertically where now you would have the area as the face here looking down onto it and then that area changes as you travel up and down slicing at different points throughout the object. And in that case your thickness would be a delta y. And that's certainly doable and we'll see examples like that. So you want to be pretty flexible with your approach. You could use x if you slice things across the x-axis. In other words, we're slicing down perpendicular to the x-axis. Or if you slice perpendicular to the y-axis, like this, then you'd have y as your variable, a thickness of delta y, so your integrals would have dy and your area would be a function of y. So you want to have some flexibility with that, which is nice to have seen some of the stuff we did with uh, areas, but using both x and y as our variable, the same ideas hold here. So in general, we have this process where we slice this like this into these segments. So we have one slice with this area a of x. And then you can think about the volume of that little slice. The reason this works, the reason this approach is useful is similar to when we started with integrals where we take a curved function, but when we start taking rectangles, we assume the top of that rectangle is flat, which is an approximation but eventually when those rectangles become infinitesimally thin, that approximation turns into reality. So the same kind of thing holds here where we assume 
that this top of this slice of bread, for instance, is flat, that it's parallel to the x-axis. And because of that, we can say that the volume of that slice is going to be that area times delta x. And then we can add all those up and approximate the total volume as the sum of all of those. And just like you did in Calc 1, then we take a limit as delta x goes to zero. So this turns into an integral and the volume becomes the integral of a of x dx, which of course is that formula we wrote down up at the top here. So that's kind of where that comes from, but the general formula to remember is that we're going to integrate this area function. Which means that when you run into a volume problem, your entire problem really is finding this area function. If you can figure out what that is, you're pretty much done. It's just a matter of calculating the integral, which will be relatively straightforward each time. And then of course you'll need limits of integration. So that's part of the problem, but that's usually not the hardest thing. Usually the hardest thing is to calculate that area function a of x. So let's see an example with a problem where we're going to calculate the volume of something like a pyramid. So here we'll have a three-dimensional picture. If we draw our axes, Here's our z-axis, x-axis, and y-axis. And then our picture will look like this. So this is almost like a pyramid, except the point of the pyramid is not above the center. So in this case, the point of the pyramid is back here on the z-axis, and that may be hard to see, but from the side, it would look like this. If this is the x-axis and this is the z-axis. So instead of coming up to a point in the center, it comes up to a point back on that back corner along the z-axis. So. This right here is at z equals 3, and these are at x and y equals 2, respectively. Okay, so we want to find the volume of this thing, and we want to figure out how to slice it in a way that's as convenient as possible. So we could try slicing this thing vertically, but it would be a lot harder to figure out what the cross-sectional areas are versus if we slice this horizontally. If we start taking horizontal slices, then the cross sections will all be squares. Right, so if we do a cross section like this, we get a little wedge and the area here is going to be a square. So we can find the area if we can figure out the lengths of these sides. So I'll call these W for width. You can call them whatever you want, but we'll call them W. Now if we've sliced it horizontally like this, we need to figure out what variable we're using which means, what does the area depend on? Does it depend on x, does it depend on y, or does it depend on z? There are a couple ways to think about this. One way is to notice that the thickness of this plate is going to be a small change in z. It's a delta z, not a delta x or a delta y, which tells us that all our variables are gonna be z's. Another way is to notice that we've sliced perpendicular to the z-axis. We didn't slice perpendicular to the x-axis or y-axis, we sliced perpendicular to the z-axis, which means that as we take different slices, as we travel up and down along this object, 
we are moving through the values of z and each time we get a different area. So our area is a function of z. It depends on where on the z-axis we take our slice. So the setup there might seem kind of complicated the first time, but the short answer is that we're slicing this in a way that makes the most sense as far as what will make the areas the easiest to find. And it turns out that slicing it horizontally with delta z makes the most sense. So the whole problem boils down to finding that area, and more specifically, if the volume is the area, it really means the volume is w squared. Because the area of that square is just length times width, or in this case, width times width, since it's indeed a square. Now it might be easiest at this point to pause and fill in the other piece of the problem, which is the limits of integration. The limits of integration will be where does the figure start and where does it stop? In other words, where are the extreme values where we'll need to draw squares like this? And it should be clear that it starts at z equals 0 and ends at z equals 3. That's where the point at the top of it is. So from 0 to 3. And of course when you're doing this, the smaller number is the lower limit of integration, the larger number is the upper. So everything to this point has just been setting up really the work we need to do. The work we need to do, the key is to find w as a function of z. In other words, the point we want to get to is where I could tell you any value of z and you could tell me the width of the square that would be drawn at that point if you slice through this triangle or this pyramid. So if you slice through this pyramid, you want to be able to look at the face that's exposed and tell me what the width is depending on what the value of z is. So that's our goal. There's a couple ways to do this, and I'll show you both common ways, but that's really the heart of the problem. If you can figure out how to do this, everything else is very straightforward. So one approach to find w is to use what we know about the extreme edges of this pyramid. So I'll say use the known values of w. Now you may look at this and say I don't know any values of w, but think carefully. There are a couple of places where if we slice this pyramid, we would know immediately what the width of the square would be. If we specifically sliced at the very bottom, at the base of this pyramid, or if we sliced at the very top, at the point. If we slice it at the bottom, the width would be 2. If we sliced at the top, the width would be 0. And based on that, we can figure out everything in between. So to do that, we're going to say when z equals 0, w equals 2. When z equals 3, w equals 0. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the line that connects these two points. Just like you did back in algebra where you'd find y equals mx plus b, now we're finding something like w equals mz plus b, which is a little weird. But it's the same idea where now our input variable is z and our output is w. So if you work this through, you'd want to find the slope, which would be the difference in what you might call y values before or w values now, divided by the difference in what we would have called x values before or z values now. So that would be negative two-thirds. And then the intercept, 
this is the value of w when z equals zero. We don't actually have to do any work there because we already know that when z equals zero, w equals two. So it turns out the equation that connects z and w is w equals negative two-thirds z plus two. So that's kind of the algebraic approach to the solution of how to find w as a function of z. Is you kind of think of your z values like x and your w values like y and you find the line that connects those two known values. There's another approach if you tend to think more in geometric terms we can use what are called similar triangles. So where the first approach was kind of your algebraic approach this is more of your geometric approach. So for this you would look at the side of this pyramid-like thing and you would see something like this where the base has length 2 and the height is 3. And then you would imagine cutting one of these slices somewhere at some value of z. So this distance from the ground up is z. And then the question is, what's this distance here, the remainder? You should pause and see if you can figure out what that distance is going to be. But notice that z plus that must equal 3. So that's just going to be the difference between 3 and z. Now, once you know all these dimensions, notice that what you really have is two triangles, one of which is inside the other. You have a triangle like this, a small one, with these dimensions, and then you have a larger one with these dimensions. And they are similar triangles because they both have a right angle, and they share this angle, so that means they share the other angle as well. And if you remember from geometry, when you have a pair of similar triangles, the angles are all equal and the sides are all proportional, which means you can set up a proportion in whatever order you like. To make it convenient, we'll say something like w over 2 is equal to 3 minus z over 3. In other words, the proportion of this base of the small triangle to the base of the large triangle is the same as the height of the short triangle and the height of the tall triangle. And you can set these proportions up in kind of whatever order you want as long as you compare the same connected sides. But now that we have that, we can solve for w, and what you get is w equals when you clean this up a little bit, you would get 1 minus 1 third z. Then when you multiply by 2, you get 2 minus 2 thirds z. Which of course is the exact same thing we got algebraically, other than the opposite order. So there's two ways to do things like this, and you'll find plenty of problems both with volumes and later on when we do some physics applications. There are plenty of problems where we take a slice out of something and we need to figure out what that cross-sectional area is. Similar triangles or this algebraic approach are common tools that we'll need to use over and over and over again. So make sure you understand this example and make sure you can do ones similar to it using either of these approaches. Really you just need to pick one and if you pick one and use it for all the examples you'll be just fine. But whichever one appeals to you more, whether you tend to think more in algebraic terms or more in geometric terms, you can kind of take your pick of the method. Once we've calculated w either of these ways, now we can go back to our problem and 
this is what we're trying to solve. We now know what w is, so the remainder of the problem is pretty quick and easy. We're just calculating a relatively straightforward integral compared to some of the ones we've done in the past. So back to finding the volume. We said the volume is equal to the integral of w squared from 0 to 3. So that would be negative 2 thirds z plus 2, all squared. Now for this, that might look like a complicated integral. You might think about using u substitution or something. But probably the easiest thing to do would just be to expand this all out. Uh, multiply it out and get a polynomial and do it term by term. You could of course use u substitution if you prefer. I will skip the details though just for sake of time and you can finish this out and see if the answer you get is 4 at the end of all, all of that. The volume of the whole thing is 4 cubic units, whatever units we use. So the key to this problem, the really the hard part that we had to get through, was calculating the width of these cross-sectional slices as a function of z. And that's consistent with a lot of these. Finding that area function is the hard part.